हेलो वेलकम टू द ईपीजी पाठशाला प्रोग्राम इन लिंग्विस्टिक्स आई एम प्रोफेसर रविंद्र गार्गेश फ्रॉम द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ लिंग्विस्टिक्स यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली टुडे वी विल डिस्कस लिंग्विस्टिक स्टाइलिस्टिक्स इन द सेवेंथ मॉड्यूल ऑन लिंग्विस्टिक स्टाइलिस्टिक्स वी विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट स्टाइल फीचर्स विच आर सिंथेक्टिक वी विल बी लुकिंग एट फीचर्स in terms of parallelism in terms of deviations and there are many many features some features would be syntactic parallelisms like refrain clausal parallelism phrasal parallelism syntactic inversions consistent use of grammatical categories and there will be many deviations like topicalization nominal syntax ambiguity in syntax code mixing code switching syntax governed by a classical language and the use of free indirect discourse the variety is huge as far as syntax is concerned but we will have to limit the discussion the objective of the module is to give you an idea about the centrality of syntax when st in stylistic analysis an author makes choices of words and puts them into unique syntactic combinations in such a way that they too become four grounded expressions with specific significations syntactic constructions are four grounded through the use of repetitions or parallel parallel forms as well as through constructions on the basis of deviance the present module is aimed at providing insight into how syntax takes the form of style generally speaking syntax is the study not only of the interrelationships between the elements comprising sentence structure but also the rules governing the arrangement of sentence structure in literary text however it is impossible to lay down strict syntactic rules at best one may attempt to lay down counter grammars of some specific text but these will not help because these will not explicate a text these will not interpret a text however syntax has immense variety in literary in literary text and we will look at these forms either through repetition or through deviations a scholar nawatni has very rightly pointed out the centrality of syntax in literary studies she says of all the elements necessary to make an utterance meaningful the most powerful is the syntax controlling as it does the order in which impressions are received and conveying the mental relations behind sequences of words and of course often it supports a poetic edifice along with other poetic devices the syntactic structure in a literary text not only shape the sign but also increases the palpability of the sign thereby opening up fresh channels of communication it particularizes and hyper semanticizes linguistic sign in literary text various kinds of syntactic structures can be seen to concretize signs differently in this module a discussion of some of the major types of syntactic structures based on parallel and deviant structures as i said before will be provided let us first begin with syntactic parallelism under syntactic parallelism important examples of repetition of syntactic structures are refrain clausal parallelism phrasal parallelism inversions consistent use of significant grammatical categories such as verb all these issues will be discussed let us begin with the refrain a refrain involves the repetition of a complete line in poetry the function of this repetition is to lay emphasis on the element of musicality for example consider the stanza o oh, cruel death give three things back sang a bone upon the shore a child found all a child can lack whether of pleasure or of rest upon the abundance of my breast 
a bone wave whitened and dried in the wind. A very interesting poem by W. B. Yeats, titled Three Things. Now, in this stanza, second and sixth line sang a bone upon the shore and a bone wave whitened and dried in the wind. These are refrains. They occur in the second and occur as the second and the sixth line in the remaining two stanzas of the poem as well. So, refrain is the total repetition of a line with all its grammatical form, all its lexical form, completely it is repeated across stanzas. And this gives the poem a song-like quality. We have many examples in Hindi also. Khub ladi mardani wo to jhansi wali rani thi. This line comes at the end of every stanza. So, we have so many refrain is a very common practice in adding musicality to poems. Then we enter into more complications, clausal parallelism. Sometimes we find clauses which are repeated, clause structures are repeated and this heightens the rhythmic effect. Let's take the lines from Shelley's Song to the Men of England. Listen carefully. The seed ye sow, another reaps. The wealthy find, another keeps. The robes ye weave, another wears. The arms ye forge, another bears. So, this is a quatrain and each line is a complete clause. And each line, all the four lines have an identical structure. The identical structure is of direct object, noun phrase and a verb. The seed is so, this article, noun, pronoun and verb, the seed is so is the direct object. Another is the pronoun, that's a noun phrase, keeps is the verb. So, direct object, noun phrase, verb is the structure of all the four lines. It is repeated, repeated. The sentence in ordinary form would be, another keeps the CD so. So, that would be the subject, another would be the subject. Keeps the verb and the CD so is the direct object. So, here the CD so has been brought to the initial position and the structure, all the four lines have the same structure. This adds to the poetic rhythm of the lines. After clausal, let us look at some phrasal parallelisms. Most modern poetry has uh, uh, phrasal parallelisms. T. S. Eliot uses it to great effect. All these uh, phrasal parallel, parallel structures when they appear in, uh, in a poem, they get uh, interlinked because of the similarity of their structure. So, that is another way of uh, linking expressions together. Here is an example. The reminiscence comes of sunless dry geraniums and dust in crevices, smells of chestnuts in the streets and female smells in shuttered rooms and cigarettes in corridors and cocktail smells in bars. So, within these lines most of the time we get a genitive construction which comprises phrasal construction in each of the lines let us say between uh, dust in crevices, smell of chestnuts in the streets, female smells in shutters, cigarettes in corridors, cocktail smells in bars. So, there is a locative construction. There is a noun phrase, locative and a noun phrase construction in all these phrases. So, it is repeated. So, this repetition also adds to musicality, it adds to quickening of the rhythm of the lines and it is also positional equivalence and all these get linked together, reflecting sickening memories of the society. We can next look at syntactic inversions and reversed grammatical categories. Syntactic inversion function to attract attention and to heighten contrast between the reversed grammatical categories. For example, what we call the beginning is often the end and to make an end is to make a beginning. This is from T. S. Eliot, Little Gidding 5. I repeat, what we call the beginning is often the end and to make an end is to make a beginning. So, beginning and end, end beginning, they, they are reversed. 
So in the, in the first line, we have the nominal form beginning and end. They occur in subject and object positions. In the other line, the roles are reversed. Now this contrast functions to obliterate, to destroy the conventional distinctions between a beginning and an end and to express the ever going, ongoing process of life. The point is that all these syntax, syntactic structures, they become signs and these signs have meanings beyond their referential meanings. They also function in as a symbol in art. Next we look at uh, consistent use of a grammatical category. Here in this case we will look at the verb. Uh, single, uh, we look at T.S. Eliot's poem Rhapsody on a Windy Night. We take an example from Rhapsody. In this poem, two kinds of verb forms create a significant pattern. First, there is the direct speech of the lamp. Lamp is a speaker. And secondly, there is the narration by the memory of the poem. So we have two people, two features. The lamp speaking, the lamppost speaking and the memory reflecting, narrating events of the past. The direct speech of the lamp exhibits an alternation between use of present tense and past tense. Here is an example. The street lamp sputtered. The street lamp muttered. The street lamp said, Regard that woman who hesitates towards you in the light of the door which opens on her like a grin. Here, all the reporting verbs, as elsewhere in the poem, are in the past tense. And the ones in the reported speech are in the present tense. In contrast, in the narration of the memory, present tense is used. On the other hand, in the narration of the memory, Present tense is used to present reminiscences of the past. For example, the memory throws up high and dry, a crowd of twisted things, a twisted branch upon the beach, eaten smooth and polished. Now here the narration is in the present tense. The verb throws, the memory throws, which reveals things related to the past, twisted things, twisted branch, eaten smooth, polished. The contrast in the use of the verb forms for the direct speech and the narration function to express that in the light of the lamp one finds symptoms of the present in the past, while in the memory the past lurks in the present. The whole poem is structured on this contrast. Then we have uh, syntactic deviations. Syntactic deviations largely mark literary significances and their variety is also very large. But we will restrict our attention on to topicalization, nominal syntax, ambiguity in syntax, code mixing, code switching, syntax foreign to the language, discontinuous syntax, and free indirect discourse. Topicalization. Topicalization is a very common device used by poets to increase the salience of words or of the constituents of a sentence. We had just seen Shelley's poem where the direct object was topicalized to the line initial position. So this topicalization involves the shifting of some element of the sentence to the line initial position. Consider, for example, one line, two massy keys he bore of metal twain. This is from Milton's Lycidas. The normal sentence of English would be, he bore two massy keys of two metals or twain metals. He bore, he carried two big keys of two metals. But in the poetic line, the genitive and the, in the above poetic line, the object is sphered from the genitive and shifted to the sentence initial position. The focus thus shifts from the subject he to the object two messy keys. So I repeat the line, two messy keys he bore of metal twain, where he, whereas he should have been in the, in the line initial position, two messy keys have been moved.
this is movement is topicalization. Nominal syntax. Nominal syntax is generally used in poetry to produce imagistic effects. The nominal structures lack verbs, whereby the force of the statement is transferred to the reference of the noun phrase. We take an example of a very, very small poem, a haiku poem. A haiku is a poem, a two line poem in the Japanese tradition. But many people have written haikus in English, in Hindi also. So let us look at one of these haiku poems. The title is, this poem is by Ezra Pound. The title is, In a Station of the Metro. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Now this is the complete poem. Title, In a Station of the Metro. The apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Now look at the syntax of the poem. It consists of only phrases. Even the title is a phrase in a station of the metro. It's a prepositional phrase. The apparition of these faces, a noun phrase. In the crowd, prepositional phrase. Petals, noun phrase. On a wet black bow, prepositional phrase. There is no verb. Here there is a lack of finite verb. And without them, the phrases have been juxtaposed creating two images. One of the apparition of the faces in the crowd. And second, petals on a wet black bow. It is left to the reader to relate these two images and to and even relate them to the title. The nominal syntax here functions to, to lend a sense of immediacy to express lost individualities in cities. So in a station of the metro, people are there without expressions, apparition of these faces like ghosts, they are crowded like petals on a wet black bow. It's a black bow, not a green bow. It's not life, it's something too mechanical. Something related to maybe industrialization, the black engines. So this is the, the syntax is indicative, is iconic of lost individualities in the cities. So syntax is a very powerful symbol by itself. Ambiguity in syntax, sometimes we find ambiguity and uh, when we have ambiguous constructions, we have to resolve the ambiguity. And in an, if, if there are two meanings of, of, the, of an ambiguous statement, both the meanings are to be taken together. It is the tension that arises from the two meanings that makes ambiguity important. Let us look at one, uh, a few lines from E. E. Cummings' poem, In. I will leave a little part of it. I will just read one which makes it ambiguous. I will read lines, I will keep quiet after a line, give a juncture, a pause. In spring comes a mender of things. In spring comes a mender of things. So in spring comes a mender of things. Four lines. First line in, second line spring comes, third line a mender, fourth line of things. Now if we look at the syntax, the syntax is one, 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 one expression. In spring comes a mender of things. Now how does one do the reading of this, this expression? In spring comes a mender of things. It is ambiguous. It is ambiguous because two grammatical readings are possible. One reading is in spring as a prepositional phrase serving as a temporal adjunct with the noun phrase a mender of things serving as the subject of the verb comes. A mender of things comes in spring. Something like that. The second one is different. The second reading could be that in is an adverb of direction and spring with its appositive a mender of things. That means spring and mender of things are the same thing, same person. It serves as a complex subject of the verb comes. Spring, a mender of things comes in. This would be one kind of reading. The other first reading, a mender of things comes in spring. Who is the mender? We don't know. 
the second one is spring a matter of things comes in comes in spring is the matter of things so spring and matter are the same same person so spring is coming in the two readings present a dual nature of spring the first shows that it is a quiet mysterious natural force and the second is that presents uh, spring as a very boisterous person who enters suddenly although in the theory of reading any second reading implies the abandoning of the first but in the case of ambiguity the two structures are to be perceived simultaneously it is in the tension that the beauty of the ambiguity the the kind of sign that it is it which is ambiguous the ambiguity is, is conveyed to the reader next is code switching code mixing the phenomena of code switching and code mixing are essentially linguistic phenomena and is part of the bilingual multilingual trait of language users the bilingual multilingual sensibilities are brought out by creative writers by exploiting the principle of code mixing mixing of two languages and code switching giving various sentences alternating sentences of from different languages let us look at an example a small example from both of these code mixing there are so many authors who use code mixing and we all use it in our daily life in our daily all educated people all any people any person who is a bilingual will code mix language every day i am referring to james joyce who is a great experimenter in language james joyce uses a code mixed variety of language a number of times in his novel ulysses and this he does so in order to reveal the personality of the characters here is a brief passage those singhalis lobbing around in the sun dolce fa niente not doing a hand turn all day now here dolce fa niente is an italian expression it means sweet for nothing so this sweet for nothing is mixed with the with the other english expression about the singhalis that is the residents of sri lanka ceylon the code mix variety here is symbolic of the modern ever roving ulysses it's about the ulysses the character but here in ulysses there's a character called leopold bloom bloom's thoughts have been transported to sri lanka by the choice of the blend of the tea that he is drinking he is drinking some tea his mind goes to sri lanka and then he considers lanka to be a very peaceful calm lazy place of course very beautiful place so this is the kind of expression this is the kind of sign that code mixing becomes in this in this piece in this passage similarly code switching also performs a similar function <clears throat> it also reveals the character's personality again i give an example from ulysses he felt her here and there will you a non vorai wonder if she pronounces that right will you not in the bed must have slid down he stopped and lifted the valas the book fallen sprawled against the bulge of the orange keyed chamber pot so again we have mixture of english and italian again with these lines represent a train of thought train of thought in the mind of lupul bloom at the asking of his wife bloom is looking for a book while searching the bed his mind wanders off to lasciviousness which is expressed by the underlined italian sentence will you and non vorrei i want and i would not like that's the meaning of the italian expression i want and i would not like so he was being mischievous when this line came to him but in the next sentence his mind comes back and he tries to look for the book so the kind of mind that leopold is having the kind of experience he is undergoing that is being represented by the code switched sign syntax governed by a classical language the syntactic structure of classical languages many a time introduced into literary language in order to convey a sense of heightened language when we use a classical language in modern poetry it means bringing about some heightened 
situation or showing trying to depict a heightened situation in a heightened language. Milton often attempted his Latinism is very famous. He used Latin constructions in his poem Paradise Lost and that gave his uh, poem a sense of height, sense of difference. People looked up to the language of the poem. So he used in uh, he used Latin syntax, ex all grammatical expressions which are natural in Latin but unnatural in English. So an example of word order unnatural in English but natural in Latin is a small example I give you. What matter where? If I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he, whom thunder hath made greater. Now here, there are three WH expressions. What matter where, what I should be, whom thunder hath made greater. Three WH expressions within the same sentence. And this is very common feature of Latin, Latin style. But this is not common in English. So this, this usage of Latin, Latin grammar, which functions to show the counter grandeur of Satan in the Paradise Lost. So the grammar has a function. Free indirect discourse has a mimetic function. It represents reality directly and makes the discourse dramatic. Now this free indirect discourse resembles indirect discourse in person and tense while it resembles direct discourse in not being strictly subordinate to a higher verb of saying, thinking and in didactic elements, the word order of questions and the admissibility of various direct discourse features. So let us take an example, small example. Jimmy understood that the game lay between Ruth and Segwa. What excitement! Exclamation mark. How much had he written? Question. Now, this is narration. It is indirect speech, but we have elements of direct speech and indirect speech. This is a small, this few lines are from James Joyce's short story, After the Race. Now, this is part of the narration where the narrator is not even a character of the story. The narrator is not character, yet we have these expressions with exclamation mark and question marks. It is the narration from the vantage view of the, of the observer. The passage is in indirect discourse, free indirect discourse. It is its commonness with indirect discourse lies in consi consistent use of the past tense throughout, throughout and the use of the third person pronoun. So we have the third person pronoun. What uh, Jimmy was excited to, he would lose. How much had he written off? So past tense and he, 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 this, all these forms are coming which is part of uh, indirect speech. But then we also have exclamation mark, which is not a part of uh, indirect speech, question mark, direct asking directly a question, which is not part of indirect speech, but this is mixed. So mixture of direct speech and indirect speech is free indirect discourse. And this free indirect discourse is used to present the atmosphere, to show what's, to give immediacy to what's going on, to give uh, a picture of what's going on in the mind of the character. It's a very powerful device. So we can summarize what have we done so far. Uh, before this, I could also like to mention one thing that many a time sentences are incomplete in syntax. Many a time sentences are incomplete like, but whenever we come across incomplete sentences in a poem or in a short story, it simply means that the author is trying to show immediacy. He's trying to show, show the immediacy of what is important immediacy of expression, immediacy of uh, the, something in the mind of the character or some, some immediacy of action. So to summarize, in the present module, what you have, what you are supposed to know is that the syntax in poetry functions through parallels and uh, deviances. And under parallels, parallel structures, we talked about refrain, clausal parallelism, phrasal parallelism, syntactic inversion, consistent use of a grammatical category. Under syntactic deviation, we had seen topicalization, nominal syntax, ambiguity in syntax, code mixing, code switching, syntax governed by a classical language, 
and free indirect discourse.